you know, at an event to mark the career of Jerry Caprio, a, a career which I've followed and been sort of collaborating from time to time in for the last 35 years, no two topics could be more relevant than central banking around the world and financial crises. So why not look at the intersection, the central bank, in a time of crisis? So what does a central banking crisis look like? An extreme example is Lebanon today. N not only are bank offices being firebombed be because depositors can't access their, their deposits, that is the central bank of, of Lebanon, their, their branch in Tripoli. But in the words of Agence France Presse, Central Bank Governor Riyad Salame now faces allegations of crimes, including embezzlement, money laundering and tax evasion in separate probes in Lebanon and abroad. In fact, I read yesterday uh, in the Financial Times that uh, he has been released from his limitation on foreign travel. He's allowed to travel now in order to go to um, a, a court hearing in, in, in Paris. And the macroeconomic picture is awful in Lebanon. Prices doubling every year, a downward spiral in GDP which has fallen every year since 2018. Oh, there's a man trying to get his money out of an ATM, but, but it's not the usual way of getting it. <laughs> that's, that's a central banking crisis. Hmm? Uh, but there's Lebanon GDP. You see how it's collapsed since 2018, uh, way, way down. It's now only about three quarters of it was what it was at the peak. And there is the inflation rate. It was all right until 2020. And now it's, you see, 150%. Then it was, I don't think it had quite reached 200% in the latest data there, um, something around 125% per annum. Most of the times, the world of central banking is calm. The task is stability. The horizon is long. Stability in prices, stability in financial markets, in the economy at large. The policies established to ensure this stability are chiefly ones of restraint. No grants for free, no free lunch. Credit given only against good collateral. Credit and asset purchases only at market prices and rates of return consistent with a balanced growth in the economy. Most of the time, price and quantity movements will be small and gradual. No surprises. That's been the hallmark of successful monetary policy in normal times for decades. But times are not always normal and calm. The financial sector can be subject to disturbances that are too large to be accommodated by gradual adjustment in central bank interest rates. The appropriate response then is not gradual. It's non-linear. It may use non-standard tools. The central bank must be ready to be a crisis manager. Well, the traditional view of central banking in general emphasized the long horizon of central bank decisions. Monetary policy operated with long and variable lags, and that implied the exercise of patience. It's going to take time. We move slowly. The chief task was one-dimensional, maintaining price stability. This could be a fairly simple task that might be achieved, for example, by holding to a constant growth rate of the money base, or that's what Friedman wanted, or by setting the central bank's lending rate uh, in accordance with a simple formula, Taylor's rule. Government deficit spending was a main influence on monetary stability, instability, so central banks should stay well away from helping out a spendthrift treasury department. And communication, well, they could be very short, very terse. The dogs bark, but the caravan moves on. That's what the longtime Bank of England Governor Montague Norman was inclined to say. Well, whatever about this old-fashioned view as a guide for central banking in times of stability. In a crisis, the appropriate stance on each of these four dimensions is quite different. First, crisis situations require prompt action. Financial market conditions can move very quickly. Irreversible damage can be caused in a matter of hours, when in the past that might have taken days or weeks or months. 
If the central bank is not ready to act quickly, or at least ready to make quick and convincing communications, it may fail in its objectives. Uh, secondly, crises can be complex. It's not near a simple linear growth path of money, or not just simple Taylor rule. Complexities in the financial instruments and, and in the strategies of systemically important institutions, they can conceal vulnerabilities, or they can generate amplification mechanisms that greatly increase the severity of the crisis. The central bank that does not continually update its awareness and understanding of these strategies can be blindsided by those channels of effect. And they can fail to rec realize the corrective actions needed to be taken before it's too late. A third point, communication is key. You can't just say, I'm, I don't care. I'm just doing what needed to be done. Multiple audiences must be convinced of the merits and the effectiveness of the central bank's action. And that includes market participants at home and abroad, international official partners and the general public, lots of different audiences. So it's not just only vital to have good communications, but those communications are multi-dimensional. And even though they're multi-dimensional, you can't have divided loyalties. You can't say one thing to one audience and another thing to the other audience because they're listening in to each other. It's just that different parts of the story are more relevant to different audiences. And fourth, government cannot be left out. It's not a question of just stay well away from government. In most cases, complementary action is needed from government if the crisis management is to be successful. Navigating the necessary negotiations with government while not compromising the independence that's fundamental to effective medium-term policy, that's exceptionally tricky. And that's especially so when poor policy by government has been part of the cause or is contributing to the severity of the crisis. So the optimal policy response to a given situation often depends on the fiscal headroom that the government has in relation to the potential fiscal costs of different alternative approaches. So what I want to do here, I want to see how these lessons emerge in a few recent cases that illustrate, again, four, four different types of crisis scenario. So the first is going to refer to a type of crisis which is a general loss of financial and monetary st and macroeconomic stability, such as has be recently been seen not just in Lebanon, but also, for example, I'm going to look at the example I'm going to look at is Argentina. The second is a more focused type of crisis, a banking crisis. Now the frequency and, and cost of banking crises in developing countries was first quantified by Jerry and Daniela back in the 1990s. And they've come back into the news again in recent weeks in this country. The potential role of the central bank in deciding whether and how to extend lender of last resort facilities and the way in which resolution of failing banks is accomplished are still prominent dimensions of the management of banking crises. Non-bank finance is a third type of crisis. It's central to a, no a third type of crisis. The failure of large non-bank financial or non-financial corporate entities can have similar damaging effects to banking crises, potentially raising difficult issues for a central bank even though it sees banks as its primary interlocutors. And recent examples in advanced economies here include the so-called dash for cash, the pandemic dash for cash in March 2020. And another curious case, the post-budget crisis in the United Kingdom in September 2022. Market maker of last resort activities of the central bank then come to the, to the fore. Now, in a less severe way, the sudden re-emergence during 21, 22 of inflation in countries that had not seen it for decades can qualify as a crisis for central banks in that it has presented central banks with difficult policy choices at a time when their reputation has been tarnished by the conspicuous failure to keep inflation under control. Even though it might be understandable, but it's very obvious that they failed on their main, 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 main um, objective. Also, reputational damage from the common belief that a decade of easy money must have contributed to the vulnerability uh, of these economies to price shocks. And the heavy financial losses that many central banks are having to report 
So I'm going to look at those four particular example types of examples. So for a systemic f macro financial crisis, there's no better place to go than Argentina. Indeed, a quarter century ago, Jerry was writing a well-known paper on the uh, Banco Central de la República's Argentina's use of lender of last resort in one of the country's previous macrofinancial meltdowns. So I just want to say a few words about Argentina's 2018 crisis. It's quite an interesting one because of the role of the central bank. By the end of 2015, when the first Kirchner government left office, Argentina's finances were once again in poor shape. Few people trusted the official figures on inflation. Prices were probably rising at about 25% per annum, but official figures didn't really show. Hold out creditors from the deep debt restructuring of some years earlier were being stiffed and supported by New York courts were reacting aggressively. Capital controls meant that informal foreign exchange market premium was more than 40%. So into this dis diff difficult situation came the center-right government led by Mauricio Macri, and he appointed the well-respected academic economist Federico Sturzenegger as governor of the central bank, P PCRA. Now, Sturzenegger is an acknowledged, and was an acknowledged expert on money and banking. He'd made important contributions to the professional literature, especially on exchange rate policy. And he was involved in the development of the program uh, with, with the government. Systematic multi-year policy was announced by the government with the support of the BCRA. It was based on inflation targeting, which would bring the inflation rate down, you remember, 25% in four annual steps to 4% by 2019. That was the goal. Reliance was going to be placed on interest rate, announcement channels of inflation targeting to achieve the inflation reduction. Uh, the exchange rate would not be pegged just rely on inflation targeting, we're going to get it down, here's the levels down to 2019, and use the interest rate. Indeed, the capital controls would be removed in stages, so that freed up the exchange rate. The primary fiscal deficit would be brought under control, that's the government's responsibility, but for political reasons, the program said it's not going to be a sudden imposition of fiscal austerity. And much of the deficit in the first years of the program would have to be financed by the central bank. Despite the expected slowing of inflation, output was not expected to contract. Indeed, the four-year projection was for cumulative growth of more than 11%. Right, fast forward four years to 2019, and let's see what happened. Okay. I do always do something wrong, I don't know why. The outturn can be only considered a failure. Inflation in 2019 was, remember it was going to be 4%, it was 54%. And output, it was going to be 11% higher, it was 4% lower than at the start. The IMF had to be called in, and faced with another exchange rate collapse, the central gov bank governor had resigned. Well, Governor Sturzenegger gives um, as the chief reason for his next one after that, if you could, um, as the chief reason for failure, the government's failure to respect the independent analysis of the central bank. After two years of well above target inflation rate, remember it was supposed to come down, but it actually kept well above the target. The central bank was trying to keep interest rates much higher than they'd expected to get that inflation rate under control. Yeah, this is the picture that shows you the planned and the outturn for cumulative GDP growth and inflation. So inflation was staying high, 2016, 2017. Interest rates are going higher and higher. The government didn't like the high interest rates. They're not politically popular. It's costing the government a lot to borrow. So what did the government do? Seeking a way out, the government unilaterally announced an easing of the inflation target for 2018. So this is the story that the central bank was, came into a program, designed the program, but when the program wasn't working out, the government said, no, you're not going to double down on this program. 
we're pulling the plug, we're going to acknowledge that inflation is going to come down a lot more slowly. And there, of course, the markets didn't like that. There followed a progressive deterioration of market expectations concerning inflation, concerning the exchange rate, concerning the government's ability to roll over maturing debt. The IMF came in, they agreed to the largest ever loan that it had made, 50 billion US dollars, and they insisted on some fiscal adjustment. The primary deficit still hadn't been reduced. But after the IMF program was agreed, the exchange rate fell sharply again. After the central bank, which had been using its foreign exchange reserves to keep the currency at, at, at better than 25 to the, to the dollar, withdrew from the market. And that, that was the point at which Sturzenegger, having lost the confidence of the government, resigned. So it's a very interesting example of the central bank being at the center of a major macroeconomic crisis. The central bank, the BCRA, faced a fast-moving and multidimensional task in this crisis. They had to deal with inherited tolerance and expectation of inflation in Argentina, a history of government debt defaults, a government with a wafer-thin majority. It might have been impossible for any central bank to persuade government in those circumstances to stick with the policies and communication consistent with an effective anti-inflation policy. The leadership of the BCRA was closely involved in the macroeconomic analysis and advice on which government policy was being made, but this advice was not always taken and clashes occurred. Yet it was not that the central bank was advocating policies that would prevent the government from being re-elected. The increasingly poor evolution of the economy and of inflation over the subsequent 18 months showed that. Scholars will continue to debate exactly what went wrong in this Argentine crisis, especially on the design and conduct of exchange rate policy. But some lessons are clear. Speed, we come to my four, four lessons. Speed, the fiscal adjustment was too slow. Complexity, the bewildering variety of borrowing instruments used by the government muddied the water. Third, on central bank government relations, although key central bank players had been involved in the initial design, central bank government relations broke down. And for communications, in the end, the market was not convinced by the official communications. Let me move to the second type of crisis and the, an example. Well, suddenly topical again, the topic of bank failures and how to prevent them has been a central theme in Jerry's work, notably with the two exotically named books that uh, Ross showed yesterday, Till Angels Govern and Guardians of Finance. How, who could ever forget those names? Um, whether it has responsibility for the prudential supervision of banks or not, the central bank is in the front line of protecting financial stability in the event of a banking crisis. If it gives ELA, emergency liquidity assistance, to a failing bank whose true underlying capital position is negative, it enables the least loyal but perhaps best informed of the bank's creditors to exit without loss at the expense of others, even if the emergency liquidity is adequately collateralized, which it should be. That underlay the hard choice that the Federal Reserve had to make in the Lehman case uh, back all those years ago. Uh, it was not until this year that we really got to see whether modern resolution techniques that provide ways of bailing in wholesale creditors, if you like investors, in a large going concern bank would really provide a way around these difficult liquidity management issues facing a central bank in a banking crisis. And it's been a mixed bag this last few weeks. Let me go through my four um, criteria. Speed. The midweek intervention into Silicon Valley Bank, SVB, in March 2023, you could say it was a speedy, indeed a rushed action, reflecting the tidal wave of depositor withdrawals. The outflows were so overwhelming that the bank didn't have time to draw down funds from the Fed, even though it did have quite a lot of eligible collateral left. Well, they, they weren't really properly prepositioned for use. But from another perspective, the intervention should have been taken months before. So speed wasn't a, a, a plus on this occasion. Given that the bank had lost an amount equivalent to its entire capital on the interest rate long-term bond speculation, and given that its deposit base was largely uninsured and unlikely to be sticky. Communications, 
Well, official communications did not reassure markets as the uh, American authorities changed their announced resolution intentions a couple of times over a few days as they struggled with the political and economic fallout that would have resulted if numerous firms holding large uninsured deposits had lost access to these deposits and had been unable to meet payroll. The resolution of Credit Suisse, the other big case uh, in Europe, it displayed some good features. There had been an exodus of depositors and that meant need for extensive liquidity support. But the Swiss financial regulator did then step in while it was still possible to sell the bank after writing down the um, AT1, the uh, secondary capital bond liabilities to zero, thereby increasing the bank's capital by a, a substantial amount, $17 billion. So arguably action was prompt enough in this case. But on complexity, when it comes to understanding the complexity of the financial instruments that were in play, it's less clear that the financial regulator of Switzerland, FINMA, had taken enough account of the impact on the market for bailable debt of exercising their right. They did have the right to write this debt down to zero when the equity shareholders still ended up with some cash from the deal, though not much compared with the prices at which the shares had been recently trading at. And so what followed was a sharp fall in the market price for bank uh, AT1 um, bonds, not only in Switzerland, but all over. And the consequences for the ability of banks to use this kind of instrument to meet their minimum ratio of loss-absorbing capital instruments, TLAC, are likely to be severe. So not so good on the complexity side. On communication, well, communication in banking crises has improved from the days when central banks felt obliged to announce, for example, in Iceland, just a couple of months before their entire banking system collapsed, Icelandic banks are well prepared to withstand increased delinquency and loan rates. They said that on the 29th of July 2008, two months before all those banks were gone. And nevertheless, in this case, uh, even though only sophisticated investors were concerned in the AT1 bonds, uh, central banks in the immediate aftermath of the Credit Suisse failure and the US authorities flip-flopping over whether to make uninsured depositors at SVB whole struggled to communicate the mixed message that, despite a wave of undoubted fragility in banking, most small and medium depositors had nothing to worry about. Now, how about government? The ro role of interactions with the government in the banking collapse, both in the Swiss case and in the action taken in the previous week to make even large depositors in SVB whole, the federal government was closely involved. For Credit Suisse, the decision to waive the normal requirement to consult shareholders when a bank is, is being taken over was discussed with the government, required an indemnity from the Swiss parliament in due course, and there was a loss sharing arrangement. So the government was very much involved, I think uh, correctly, re uh, the central bank correctly recognizing that they had to work closely with government. And similar, I won't go into details because I think it's well known to the, to the audience. Here, um, the US Treasury Fed interactions related to S SVP and various guarantees and um, but losses incurred by uh, US governmental institutions. Now, let me move on quickly to the third type of crisis, the financial market dysfunction. I'm just looking at, at time. No, we're all right. I'm come to a, coming to an, another slide now, but I'm just having a little bit of doubt over, over how I'm doing for, for time. And I'm not doing all that well. Banking is not the only source of financial market failure requiring innovative and sometimes daring central bank policy. Two striking recent cases show central banks operating quickly and at substantial scale to stabilize key financial markets disrupted by sudden news events. Speed, complexity, government involvement, and communication are all interacting here. Now, I'm only going to take one of the examples, um, and that is the one involving British government bonds. I was going to say something about the um, dash for cash, but I don't think I have time to do that. Uh, the British government bond crisis of, of 2008-2009 
uh, September 2022, just last September. It's a remarkable downward spiral in the price of these uh, bonds immediately after the poorly received government's budget statement of September 2022. It's particularly interesting from our perspective because of the interaction between government and, uh, and, and central bank. And not just because it was followed immediately by the resignation of the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer. It landed the central bank, the Bank of England, in a tricky situation with a threefold objective, but only one instrument, namely the purchase of, of um, bonds, gilts. The three objectives were, first, they needed to reduce the bank's holding of government bonds, which had been accumulated over the period of quantitative easing, and they had announced that they were going to do this as part of the tightening of monetary policy. So you couldn't go and say, well, we're actually going to reduce our holding of, of bonds, and the next thing we're going to do is going to buy them. The second objective they had was to make sure that the government wasn't seen, uh, the, the Bank of England wasn't seen as providing political support to a weak government which had just announced a lax budget which had raised doubts about its competence in fiscal policy. So the Bank of England is saying we're having a problem here. Bond prices are falling dramatically. We don't want bond prices to have fallen so much. But we don't want to be buying bonds because we just said we were going to start selling our big backlog of bonds. And we certainly don't want to be buying bonds to, that helps the government because that will make people say, you're not independent at all. You're just cozying up to the government. And the third reason was this downward spiral in gilt prices in the prices of bonds. It was being triggered by massive correlated sales of bonds by or on behalf of pension funds who had to meet cash calls on their complex leveraged instruments triggered by the initial fall in prices. Prices fall, you need to get more, more collateral, you've got to sell more bonds. And so the first two problems pointed to a con continuing sales of gilts in line with a recently announced program. Recently announced program, we continue it. Would we buy bonds? No, that would seem that we're supporting the government, so we'd continue to sell. But if we're to support this, this spiral, this cumulative spiral affecting pension funds, we've got to buy. So which way do you do it? Well, at first, the Bank of England said, we're not going to do anything. They got calls from sources sympathetic to government to reverse the policy rate increase of the previous e week. But the Bank of England said on September the 26th, we're committed to price stability. We're not bailing out the government. Only a few days later did they address objective three. And they announced their intention, well, we will buy some bonds, actually. But we're only going to buy them for a very short period of time. We'll buy over the following two and a half weeks in order to restore orderly market conditions. The purpose of saying we're only going to buy over two and a half weeks is, was to say, don't worry, we're going to go back to the sales, the medium-term program. And we're not bailing out the government because after two and a half weeks, it's over. So this two and a half weeks of purchases will give the pension funds enough time to sort the liquidity issues and the uh, delivery of collateral. Well, the time limit caused raised eyebrows in the markets. Would it be long enough? This was high wire acrobatics, but in the end it did work. After the initial relief that immediately brought yields sharply down, they moved up again. I do have a chart which I'm not going to. Whoops, well, that is Argentina, I'm sorry. And yes, I'd forgotten that about Argentina. The Bank of England is so interested in this that they've produced not just day by day, but hour by hour or minute by minute charts of the way the, uh, the uh, bond yields moved up and down, up and down as the market uh, absorbed announcements from the Bank of England. In the end, it did work reasonably speedily and effectively to avoid economic damage from this episode, even though it changed the political leadership in Britain. Well, I want to come finally to the crisis of reputation, inflation, the return of inflation. And having skipped a bit, I'm not going to jump right in. It's, it's actually it's more than 30 years since Jerry and myself collaborated on a book called Monetary Policy Instruments for Developing Countries. So I hope he agrees with my analysis of central banks' current monetary policy problems in the new inflation crisis. Uh, for me, 
the problem is more one of reputation than of performance. The surge in inflation is closely tied to the economic effects of the pandemic and Russia's evasion of Ukraine. Uh, both of these are events which were, of course, as of 2019, well outside the likely range of future events, though policy based on decision theory, of course, would have taken account of the possibility of tail risk events. But here's my analysis of the inflation is, look, for two decades, global supply shocks were generally in the direction of increasing supply. And the fiscal impulse to aggregate demand in the major advanced economies was more often too weak than too strong. So these repeated negative impulses, both on the supply and the demand side, gradually weakened the amplification mechanisms, the second round effects that had been so important in making inflation of the 1970s and 80s persistent as economic agents sought to restore their purchasing power. With inflation in many countries more often below target than above in the past decade as a consequence, it was inevitable and correct that the central banks would have been using their tools of expansion, low policy interest rates, purchase of medium and long-term securities in, in, in QE pro programs. Indeed, as actual inflation came in below expectation year after year in the euro area, it appeared to many that the expansionary tools of central banking were insufficient to ensure that inflation could be maintained as high as 2%. And then 2020 came the pandemic. At first, inflation stalled once again. And it was understandable that major economies would boost spending power, we talked about it in earlier sessions, by channeling income support to households and businesses adversely affected by the economic shutdowns. The other argument given in favor of fiscal expansion in 2020, namely supporting aggregate demand, was not as plausible given that so many parts of supply were not at that time available to meet demand. As the shutdowns eased, there were further waves of fiscal expansion to an extent that in some important cases, such as the United States, was not justified by any prospective insufficiency of aggregate demand. Now, we're all aware of the shift in demand from services to goods that occurred during the sh shutdowns and the consequences this had for prices given the, given the strain on supply chains, including logistics. Suddenly, supply shocks were going negative, to which the Russian invasion of Ukraine has added. And now, after three years of repeated adverse impulses to supply, the upward pressure on prices has acquired a momentum which is not yet being choked off because of the large accumulation of household savings in the pandemic and, albeit to a lesser extent, because of the increased liquidity resulting from QE of the accumulated assets. I believe that, albeit simplified, this summary represents a now generally accepted narrative of the origins of the surge of inflation into double digits in many advanced economies. Were central banks correct to allow this first new wave of inflation for many years to occur at first without taking corrective action? Where inflation had been running below target for several years, as in the euro area, there was one clear justification for allowing the inflationary surge to bring average inflation up to the previous over the previous decade up to the target. But central banks had not indicated an intention to correct past undershoots. These issues were not extensively aired in central banks' public communications. The general public just understood that central banks were in charge of keeping inflation low and that unpopular interest rate movements could be accepted as the price for keeping inflation low. Now inflation has not been low for two years. Indeed, during 21-22, it has been exceeding central banks' published forecasts reasonably systematically. And this is a reputational hit that central banks will struggle with. Their decision, at least in the advanced economies, seems likely to be, continue to be in a hawkish direction. If they cannot bring inflation down in a reasonably ti reasonable time frame, the rationale for central bank independence will begin to wear thin. Ma many central bankers will therefore be inclined to err on the side of being too tight rather than too loose, even at the risk of creating or prolonging recession. Well, in conclusion, I... Uh, we have ample experience now from this that increasing complexity of financial instruments, 
and the interlinkages between finance and the real economy mean that central banks in all countries, developing and advanced, need to understand in detail how large parts of the economic and financial system seemingly remote from banking and exchange rates work in practice. They've, central banks have always had to be alert to the sudden emergence of fast-moving crises. The speed of response needed nowadays has accelerated. The quality and sophistication of the central bank's own communications in this environment are, as, are important as never before. Not so much, perhaps, in terms of speed, but in terms of ensuring that there is a public understanding of what the central bank is doing and why it is doing that. Without such an understanding, political support for the independent of, independ, in, political independent of central banking can le leak away. And in crises, the need for aggressive and innovative use of central banking tools can run up against boundaries of the central bank's mandates and powers as determined by legislation. And for this reason, close communication between central bank and government is vital in times of crisis. Properly conducted, this is not a weakening of central bank independence, but an assurance. Jerry, what an interesting area you chose to work in. First at the Fed and then as a gamekeeper turned poacher at a major Wall Street firm, and then as an advisor to financial authorities all over the world, and most recently here at Williams College forming the next generation of, of leading central bankers. I think that you would agree that it is in times of crisis that central banking is most interesting and most challenging. Thank you for your talks, uh, sir. Uh, so traditional, traditional view says that central bank need to be independent, but in times of crisis, sometimes central bank may need to work with government. And I was wondering how that affects the central bank's independence. Yeah, I, I think this is something that a lot of people struggle with, and they even feel that talking at the senior level between central banks and government should be um, just very formal and not, uh, not really collaborative. The central bank independence, to me, is a matter of decision-making on the tools that are given to the central bank in, by law. So that I often used to get calls from the uh, senior treasury officials, usually not from the minister, because the ministers don't understand the details. And, and I, actually, I remember being down, the last time I was down in the southern cone, I was in, in, in uh, Santiago, I got a call, a telephone call, what is this, a permanent secretary of the, of the, the could you, what, I just came up with a great solution for this problem that we had, could you do this? I said, I certainly could not do that, it would be illegal. So, I didn't mind, I didn't mind getting the call. Um, it was worth, he, he didn't understand that it would be illegal, um, but, you know, this, if it, if it was something that could be consistent with the goals and mandate and powers, of the central bank, and it was something that was good for the economy, he's going to do this. Maybe under those circumstances, maybe I couldn't do that, but not what he was proposing, which was illegal. And it was not only one example, that me many examples of detailed phone calls where you say, okay, so you can't do this, but maybe you could do that. Oh yeah, that might be a good idea. That even, I haven't even thought of that. It's a really good idea, and I want to do it. So. So I, I think uh, this may convey my idea of independence as opposed to collaboration. Um, thank you. So I want to ask a question about inflation. So you mentioned that, let me just take this off. Yeah. So you mentioned that the current surge of inflation is kind of as a result of what happened in the pandemic, fiscal expansion and, you know, a bunch of other things. Um, and central banks essentially exist in one sense to sort of fight inflation. But you also made the point that 
there's some reputational decline, if you like, in terms of how people perceive central banks. And yet the medicine for inflation often is painful to administer. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, could you just speak to how that job of doing the hard things has gotten more difficult in the context of, like central banks now are looked at as sort of being one, the cause of some of these mm -hmm. challenges and don't necessarily have the goodwill. Mm -hmm. I think very often central banks try to speak in a language which is a technocratic language, uh, understood by, you know, by economists and financial experts. And they don't really feel the need to reach down to the general public. But the general public is not so far below. <laughs> Maybe a little bit, uh, don't know the, the jargon. The central bank needs to know what it's, why it's taking these decisions. It needs to acknowledge errors. It needs to find a way of communicating um, well, we did that, and this is why we did it. But actually, if we knew what was going to happen, we might have done something different. Um, and, and need to be a little bit more give and take, and not just, um, we have one goal, one instrument, leave it to us. Uh, that's OK as long as it works. When it doesn't work, people say, you told us. You, you said just trust it. Don't ask us what we're doing. Just trust us. And we trusted you, and you messed up. And as I, the way I described it, I'm not sure that central banks me messing up is not a good description of what happened, though they would probably redo, would have done things slightly differently if they knew what it was going to happen. At, at the risk of using an American cultural metaphor, you sort of described a, an incredible Hulk version of the central bank. Normally, it's the mild-mannered scientist. And under certain circumstances, it turns into the rampaging superhero. So could you discuss a little bit the internal process by which a central bank makes the decision that a normal problem has become a crisis and how the institution mobilizes itself to address a crisis once once identified? Yeah, well, that's a, uh, this, this speaks to some of the complexity that I was talking about. Um, I, I re remember um, when I was a young economist at the Central Bank, long before I came back to the Central Bank, um, we had a very um, genial governor. And um, he would come into a meeting with you know, officials around the table, and he'd say, it was uni always he would make this joke, so we, everybody remembers, he'd say, well, as Napoleon used to say, I don't know whether you will uh, intimidate the enemy, but you certainly intimidate me. So <clears throat> the reason I use the example is that the, if the staff are on top of what's going on, um, the top decision makers, having had repeated interactions with those staffs and trying to understand their, their, their analysis, can be ready to get up to speed very quickly. Um, with trusted analysis. So it means that central banks need to be probing and understanding what's going on in the economy at the staff level and to have sufficient communication to the top decision makers. It's not always the case that top decision makers are equipped to understand technicalities. So if the research economist says, no, OK, we have a, we have a you know, liquidity crisis here, and let me show you the R squared statistics. And let me, we actually used some, some uh, more sophisticated estimation process. That's, that's going to go beyond. Again, it's a question of internal communication so that, um, so that the relevant people can, uh, can be up to speed quickly. If you read analyses of 1992, uh, e ERM crisis, when the, the Bank of England, um, w the sterling was falling out of the fixed exchange rate mechanism that they, they had agreed to. Uh, it's a good example of how not to make decisions. So the senior cent central bankers went around to a room in the, US, in the British Treasury, and they sat in the room and, and worried about things and got telephone calls. They didn't even have a television in the room. They didn't know what was going on. They didn't have the expert staff. OK, they were experts in themselves, but there were two or three people in a room for vital hours. So I'm trying to give you, convey to you an idea that an, a, a deep understanding of what is currently going on in central banking and in, in, in the, the financial affairs 
um, is, is important to be able to respond. And what's not good is what I've often seen, is a repetition of mantras. Um, we, only, we, only, we only need to do things. We follow the Taylor rule. We, you know, we've calculated the Taylor rule, and this is it. That's all we have to do. A rep repetition of mantras, going to dinners with the same people, week after week, uh, repeating the same shibboleths, uh, and groupthink, and, and resistance to uh, dissident views. Dissident views very, very important. Dissident might have been saying, you're going to have a bank failure, that, that Silicon Valley Bank is in trouble. Yeah, he's, a, he's always, he always, we forecast 10 of the last three crises. Um, so so it, is a, it, is an, it is an intellectual uh, enterprise. There are a lot of critiques sometimes from left, from politically left, of the power of central banks in research. They're, they're, they suck in all the best researchers. All the best, no, but lots of the best researchers. And they are, there may be some legitimacy in that, that you're starving the rest of the economy, which is also important. But it is terribly important that, um, that, that good economic understanding is available to the top decision makers. Thanks for your wonderful insight. I'm curious, I wanted to pick up, you talked about the importance of communication and com frank communications mm -hmm. uh, with the public and not just with the technical audience. I also wonder to what extent have central banks taken on too much? They were the only game in town after 2008 and you talked about them, um, their increase in importance in market functioning so at what point in time, there are the images of Super Mario, so <laughs> threatening independence. So where do you see the limits of uh, central bank ability? And um, on inflation, I take the point on the Eurozone. What about the US? To what extent after um, the initial package in 21, to what extent could, <laughs> could have the Fed taken off, or ha could have at least started mm. with uh, um, selling off or at least letting some of the um, um, government uh, securities and other securities they acquired, just letting mm. them roll off. Mm -hmm. um, now, well, on, on the question of whether central banks are taking too much on, um, there's a lot of one, once central banks started doing things after the global financial crisis, then people, both pro and anti, said, oh, we didn't realize you could do all those things. Why don't you do that in the interest of our little sector? Um, and of course, it wasn't in the interest of any particular sector, but, but for the economic uh, performance as a whole, that the actions were being taken. But the consequences, never looked at before, of central bank action on income inequality, for example, became high profile because uh, everybody could see that QE was increasing the price of financial assets that were being held largely by rich people. So they said, oh, okay, so central banking is about inequality. Well, it does have effects on inequality, although they, they average out over, over the cycle. I think the conclusion I I is that if the central banks don't communicate about the, the impact of their actions on important issues like inequality, on climate change. They can do very little on climate change. They can do a bit. Uh, they, they can decide not to you know, buy the bonds of uh, coal producing companies in their portfolio of QE assets, for example. But if they don't talk about it, if they pretend that they're not interested, they're not part of the economy, they're just interested in, in, the, um, in inflation narrowly, then they lose public support. They got to speak to the public in the language the public understands, the, with the concerns the public has. The public knows that, um, you know, if, if you are concerned about some particular uh, uh, difficult area or difficult sector, if the central bank would provide some money for that sector, that would be great. The public also knows it's not going to do that. But the, to but the conversation has to be had. I'm not going to go to get into which month the, the Fed should have changed its rates, which month it should have um, 
started acting on, on, on QE, because I'm not close enough to it. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a very important question. It's an even more difficult question for the Eurozone. We, we can come back to this question in three years' time when, when this is all sorted. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Um, I want to kind of probe a bit deeper and go more specifically in the institutional structure of central banks. And that kind of actually relates a little bit to what Daniela already alluded to. And that is, um, I mean, some of the crises which you mentioned, I think the Swiss one, for example, you have a central bank, you have a bank supervisor. Others, Federal Reserve, they're kind of in one house. Mm -hmm. Do you have any views on, and I have my views, but I want to hear your <laughs> views. Is there any structure that works better in terms of these different criteria that you have uh, mentioned? Mm -hmm. And maybe just to make it a little bit more interesting, both in normal times, but then also especially in, the, in, uh, in crisis times. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, the, the central bank, always gets drawn into a crisis even if it's not even if it's not being involved in supervision or so forth it gets drawn in because at the end of the day they're the only people who can provide the cash if cash needs to be provided and um, what what the institutional arrangement should be um, is a debate that you know i've been involved in for a quarter century and even in the european context or you're discussing these things in countries like sweden and iceland and britain um, and, and the European Union, uh, it, it's, it's very difficult, but a, a number of principles. First of all, even if the central bank is not in charge of supervision, it needs to have full information, it needs to have full access to information, and that may, can, need, it can require legal changes. Because you have the supervisor say, oh, well, we, we do have that information that you were asking about, but we are not allowed to give it because this was asked from the firms for the purpose of supervision, and you're not doing supervision. So you're not going to have it until it's too late. So their, their institutional arrangement has have to be made even if supervision is outside the, the central bank. I think also um, decision making, if, if the decision making on financial crises, on financial um, uh, stability issues, is located in a body chaired by the minister, that, I think, th really threatens to undermine central bank independence. And so I think that if there are institutional arrangements like that, that they, for example, one, one solution to that is, minister can chair, that's fine, but that that body can only take decisions, yes or no, on the basis of proposals from the central bank. See how you can preserve the independence of the central bank saying, okay, we are prepared to give money for this. Approved. Uh, and the minister will say, well, what about doing that? Central Bank can say, wait a minute, if we want to do that, we will give you a proposal on it. You, you, can't, um, you can't outvote us on it uh, and just say, well, this is my proposal. I think there's a big country, small country issue. Um, capacity. Uh, in, in Iceland have just merged everything into a, one institution. They've actually squashed the people into the same building even. <laughs> they weren't so happy about that. But, um, and, and I think that's realistic. Uh, Iceland has lots of clever economists. But still, it's a small country, and so you, if you try to duplicate things, and I'm sure a lot of emerging markets and, and, and uh, developing countries, it's the same story. There are five or six people who are really good, and if you spread them among four agencies, that's one and a half in each agency, and they can't collaborate, and, and, and they can't uh, you know, drop what they're doing and, and, and do something else. Well, last question. Oh, in the present surge of inflation, uh, in the nature of things, some central banks did better than others, better than the average. Mm -hmm. Which ones were they and why? <laughs> Just a few examples. <laughs> you know, this is something that's really, it's, it's really hard to say yet. Yet, you know? So, so this debate is going on right now in, in, the, in the US, but I'm more familiar with, it, with the situation in, in Europe. Um, and there are hawks and doves. And some of the hawks have always been hawks, and some of the doves have always been doves, regardless of the economic situation. Um, and you know, these are the people who have the votes. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's, it's still, the jury is still out on whether a more rapid uh, rate increase in Europe would have sorted the inflation with less economic damage. I think the majority view in the market and in, by you know, commentariat is, yeah, they should have moved earlier and faster. They were talking a lot about moving before they moved, with the result that longer-term interest rates did move up 
So they got some effect just by talking. Um, we don't know. Is, how strong are the second round effects? If the second round effects are as bad as they used to be in the 1970s, then it was a bad mistake not to move earlier and faster and higher. Um, there is so far no evidence, and the evidence is against the second round effects, uh, the uh, wage responses being as fast as they were in the 1970s, but there is some response. So I think the, the jury is still out. I think the, the, even if the, the doves are a, a little bit on the back foot now, that they may, the, the final scorecard, when it's d written in about, like, say, three years, might, might give them a, a, a more of a, a say than, um, than it looks like now. Thank you. So I think we should unfold this particular event to a close. Thank you, Patrick. Fabulous. Thank you. Talk.